Book Two, Chapters Twelve and Thirteen of On the Education of an Orator by Quintilian, translated by H. E. Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. I must, however, admit that the general opinion is that the untrained speaker is usually the more vigorous. This opinion is due primarily to the erroneous judgment of faulty critics who think that true vigor is all the greater for its lack of art, regarding it as a special proof of strength to force what might be opened, to break what might be united, and to drag what might be led. Even a gladiator who plunges into the fight with no skill at arms to help him, and a wrestler who puts forth the whole strength of his body the moment he has got a hold, is acclaimed by them for his outstanding vigor, although it is of frequent occurrence in such cases for the latter to be overthrown by his own strength, and for the former to find the fury of his onslaught harried by his adversary with a supple turn of the wrist. But there are many details in this department of our art which the unskilled critic will never notice. For instance, careful division under heads, although of the utmost importance in actual cases, makes the outward show of strength seem less than the reality. The unhewn block is larger than the polished marble, and things, when scattered, seem more numerous than when placed together. There is, moreover, a sort of resemblance between certain merits and certain defects. Abuse passes for freedom of speech, rashness for courage, prodigality for abundance. But the untrained advocate will abuse too openly and too often, even though, by so doing, he imperils the success of the case which he has undertaken, and not seldom his own personal safety as well. But even such violence will win men's good opinion, since they are only too pleased to hear another say things which nothing would have induced them to utter themselves. Such speakers are also less careful to avoid that other peril, the pitfall of style, and are so reckless in their efforts that sometimes in their passion for extravagance they light upon some really striking expression. But such success is rare, and does not compensate for their other defects. For the same reason, the uninstructed sometimes appear to have a richer flow of language, because they say everything that can be said, while the learned exercise discrimination and self-restraint. To this must be added the fact that such persons take no trouble to prove their contentions, and consequently steer clear of the chilly reception given in our decadent law courts to arguments, and seek only for such themes as may beguile the ears of the public, even at the cost of appealing to the most perverted tastes. Again, their epigrams, the sole objects of their quest, seem all the more striking, because of their dreariness and squalor of their context, since flashes are more clearly seen against a background not of mere shade, as Cicero says, but of pitchy darkness. Well, let the world credit them with as much genius as it pleases, so long as it is admitted that such praise is an insult to any man of real eloquence. Nonetheless, it must be confessed that learning does take something from oratory, just as the file takes something from rough surfaces, or the whetstone from blunt edges, or age from wine. It takes away defects, and if the results produced after subjection to the polish of literary study are less, they are less only because they are better. But these creatures have another weapon in their armory. They seek to obtain the reputation of speaking with greater vigor than the trained orator by means of their delivery, for they shout on all and every occasion, and bellow their every utterance with uplifted hand to use their own phrase dashing this way and that, panting, gesticulating wildly, and wagging their heads with all the frenzy of a lunatic. Smite your hands together, stamp the ground, slap your thigh, your breast, your forehead, and you will go straight to the heart of the dingier members of your audience. But the educated speaker, 
just as he knows how to moderate his style and to impart variety and artistic form to his speech is an equal adept in the matter of delivery and will suit his action to the tone of each portion of his utterances while if he has any one canon for universal observance it is that he should both possess the reality and present the appearance of self-control but the ranters confer the title of force on that which is really violence you may also occasionally find not merely pleaders but what is far more shameful teachers as well who after a brief training in the art of speaking throw method to the winds and yielding to the impulse of the moment run riot in every direction abusing those who hold literature in higher respect as fools without life courage or vigor and calling them the first and worst name that occurs to them still let me congratulate these gentlemen on attaining eloquence without industry method or study as for myself i have long since retired from the task of teaching in the schools and of speaking in the courts thinking it the most honourable conclusion to retire while my services were still in request and all i ask is to be allowed to console my leisure by making such researches and composing such instructions as will i hope prove useful to young men of ability and are at any rate a pleasure to myself chapter thirteen let no one however demand from me a rigid code of rules such as most authors of textbooks have laid down or ask me to impose on my students of rhetoric a system of laws immutable as fate a system in which injunctions as to the exordium and its nature lead the way then come the statement of facts and the laws to be observed in this connection next the proposition or as some prefer the digression followed by prescriptions as to the order in which the various questions should be discussed with all the other rules which some speakers follow though they had no choice but to regard them as orders and as it were a crime to take any other line if the whole of rhetoric could be thus embodied in one compact code it would be an easy task of little compass but most rules are liable to be altered by the nature of the case circumstances time and place and by hard necessity itself consequently the all-important gift for an order is a wise adaptability since he is called upon to meet the most varied emergencies what if you should instruct a general as often as he marshals his troops for battle to draw up his front in line advance his wings to left and right and station his cavalry to protect his flank this will perhaps be the best plan if circumstances allow but it may have to be modified owing to the nature of the ground if for instance he is confronted by a mountain if a river bars his advance or his movements are hampered by hills woods or broken country or again it may be modified by the character of the enemy or the nature of the crisis by which he is faced on one occasion he will fight in line on another in column on one he will use his auxiliary troops on another his legionnaires while occasionally a feint of flight may win the day so too with the rules of oratory is the exordium necessary or superfluous should it be long or short addressed entirely to the judge or sometimes directed to some other quarter by the employment of some figure of speech should the statement of fact be concise or developed at some length continuous or divided into sections and should it follow the actual or an artificial order of events the orator will find the answers to all these questions in the circumstances of the case so too with the order in which questions should be discussed since in any given debate it may often suit one party best that such and such a question come up first while their opponents would be best suited by another for these rules have not the formal authority of laws or decrees of the plebs but are with all they contain the children of expediency i will not deny that it is generally expedient to conform to such rules otherwise i should not be writing now but if our friend expediency suggests some other course to us why we shall disregard the authority of the professors and follow her for my part above all things 
This I enjoin and urge and urge anew, that in all his pleadings the orator should keep two things constantly in view, what is becoming and what is expedient. But it is often expedient and occasionally becoming to make some modification in the time-honored order. We see the same thing in pictures and statues. Dress, expression, and attitude are frequently varied. The body, when held bolt upright, has but little grace, for the face looks straight forward, the arms hang by the side, the feet are joined, and the whole figure is stiff from top to toe. But that curve, I might almost call it motion, with which we are so familiar, gives an impression of action and animation. So, too, the hands will not always be represented in the same position, and the variety given to the expression will be infinite. Some figures are represented as running or rushing forward, others sit or recline, some are nude, others clothed, while some again are half-dressed, half-naked. Where can we find a more violent and elaborate attitude than that of the Discobolus of Myron? Yet the critic who disapproved of the figure because it was not upright would merely show his utter failure to understand the sculptor's art, in which the very novelty and difficulty of execution is what most deserves our praise. A similar impression of grace and charm is produced by rhetorical figures, whether they be figures of thought or figures of speech, for they involve a certain departure from the straight line, and have the merit of variation from the ordinary usage. In a painting, the full face is most attractive, but Apelles painted Antigonus in profile, to conceal the blemish caused by the loss of one eye. So, too, in speaking, there are certain things which have to be concealed, either because they ought not to be disclosed, or because they cannot be expressed as they deserve. Timanthes, who was, I think, a native of Sidness, provides an example of this in the painting with which he won the victory over Calates of Teus. It represented the sacrifice of Iphigenia, and the artist had depicted an expression of grief on the face of Calchas, and of still greater grief on that of Ulysses, while he had given Menelaus an agony of sorrow beyond which his art could not go. Having exhausted his powers of emotional expression, he was at a loss to portray the father's face as it deserved, and solved the problem by veiling his head and leaving his sorrow to the imagination of the spectator. Salus did something similar when he wrote, I think it better to say nothing of Carthage, rather than say too little. It has always, therefore, been my custom not to tie myself down to universal or general rules, this being the nearest equivalent I can find for the Greek Catholic rules. For rules are rarely of such a kind that their validity cannot be shaken and overthrown in some particular or other. But I must reserve each of these points for fuller treatment in its proper place. For the present, I will only say that I do not want young men to think their education complete when they have mastered one of the small textbooks of which so many are in circulation, or to ascribe a talismanic value to the arbitrary decrees of theorists. The art of speaking can only be attained by hard work and assiduity of study, by a variety of exercises and repeated trial, the highest prudence and unfailing quickness of judgment. But rules are helpful all the same, so long as they indicate the direct road, and do not restrict us absolutely to the ruts made by others. For he who thinks it an unpardonable sin to leave the old, old track, must be content to move at much the same speed as a tight rope walker. Thus, for example, we often leave a paved military road to take a short cut, or finding that the direct route is impossible owing to floods having broken down the bridges, are forced to make a circuit, while if our house is on fire and flames bar the way to the front door, we make our escape by breaking through a party wall. The orator's task covers a large ground, is extremely varied and develops some new aspect almost every day, so that the last word on the subject will never have been said. 
I shall, however, try to set forth the traditional rules and to point out their best features, mentioning the changes, additions, and subtractions which seem desirable. End of chapter 13